Right. So a big part of what we do in our lab is we look at protein and leucine thresholds. Some of you guys that know me know that <clears throat> it takes a specific amount of protein or leucine to actually get a protein synthesis response from the meal. Um, and one of the things we thought of with the way Americans typically eat is they typically eat low protein breakfast, low protein lunch, and then a big protein dinner. They get, most Americans get about 60 to 70 percent of protein at dinner in one meal. And our thoughts are there's there's a cap to how much animalism you can get from a meal. And if you're not you're not getting enough to hit your threshold at breakfast and lunch to you know to hit your leucine and protein threshold, you're not going to be able to make up for that by having a bigger meal at dinner. You're not going to be able to make up for that lack of stimulation at another meal. So like if we have our like. For an average person, you know, eating three meals a day, if we have our kind of theoretical optimal protein distribution, we have a meal, each meal hits the protein threshold to maximize muscle protein synthesis. Or we have what most people do, low protein breakfast, low protein lunch, and then a really high protein dinner, we're only going to get one stimulation of protein synthesis a day. So theoretically, we should see differences in body composition, right? So what we did was we had subjects and we fed them the complete same diets. Same total protein, carbs, fats, same protein source, we used whey protein. The only difference was one group ate all their protein evenly distributed over three meals and the other group ate their protein 70% uh, of it at dinner and then 15% at breakfast and 15% at lunch. And we fed them these diets for 11 weeks and what we saw was at the end of 11 weeks, the animals eating uh, evenly distributed protein right here it had actually greater muscle mass. They had greater muscle mass in their calves. So these are the gastrocnemius, the greater muscle mass. Yeah. And this corresponded to postprandial rates of muscle protein synthesis. So you can see here, this is the, the rate of muscle protein synthesis after the breakfast and lunch meals. And as you can see, this unevenly distributed group is not getting a response to protein synthesis, whereas the evenly distributed group, getting more protein at breakfast, is getting a significant response. So basically what you find is that, you know, this correlated to plasma leucine, as you can see here, there wasn't enough protein to get a response of plasma leucine at, this, at the breakfast meal, whereas the animals getting more protein got a plasma leucine response. So what this says is, you know, the idea that like you can eat low protein throughout the day and you know make up for it by eating a real high protein meal at dinner or some other time is really a fallacy. You're not going to be able to do that. Your overall nitrogen balance may be the same because you're getting enough total protein, but nitrogen balance, it's important to realize, is not muscle anabolism. Nitrogen balance is more influenced by gut tissue turnover. And that is actually shown by our results in the same study. Even though we showed an increase in muscle mass, there was no difference in actual lean body mass between the groups. But that's because lean body mass includes things like bone, gut tissues, skin, all these other tissues that you have in the milieu. And what we actually showed was animals eating unevenly distributed protein with a heavier protein dinner had bigger livers. So they had bigger livers. So they were disposing those amino acids, they were using them, but they were putting it into a different tissue. So, you know, you're going to get bigger gut tissue, so your overall nitrogen balance is probably the same, but muscle anabolism is different. So that's a really important fact to keep in mind.